parameterized tests of GUnit are disappointing. Have always been. They were supposed to improve in GUnit 5, but failed. I hear voices urging to abandon doomed GUnit. Not in my head or anything, on the internet there are advocates of newer, better testing frameworks. And I'm not saying that it's completely a bad idea, there might be some interesting features, especially, in my opinion, for higher tier tests. But the clumsiness of parameterized tests is often used as an example of inferiority of GUnit. And that's wrong, because there is a better way to write dynamic tests within GUnit now. Please allow me to introduce you to test factories. Let's say we have a function we want to test. This palindrome, something that most probably you will never encounter in real life. That's why it's so convenient to have it as a test example. For those like me who always forget those definitions, palindrome is a sequence of letters that reads the same way forwards as backwards. We'll start with the vanilla JUnit test method that checks that our function returns true for the poop input. We will want to check other cases like poo, which isn't a palindrome, that means our function should return false, and so on and so forth, so this can quickly become very repetitive and tedious. So it might be tempting to merge those tests into one larger test that checks various situations. And let's start implementing our function. For now it just always says yes. And we see that if we just do multiple assertions, it's not very convenient because we will stop the test on the first failure. To work this around, we have the concept of soft assertions. If we wrap our assertions with it, then we'll get a nice report which tells us what is the overall state of our test. The soft assertions is already a very good technique that can let us go very far. But we could also take a small step further and produce a dynamic test by marking our test method with the test factory annotation and producing a list of dynamic nodes. Those nodes will be our dynamic tests, or even groups of tests, as I will show later. And if you're in Java, you can of course use streams, because that would be more convenient. We start by defining our test cases. In this situation, when we have very simple input and output check, we can rely on built-in structures like maps, or in this case, a list of Kotlin pairs, but there is also nothing wrong with defining a special class for a particular test. And at the end we return our test cases, each mapped to a dynamic test. The first parameter of the dynamic test factory method is the name of the test case that will be displayed by the IDE, for example. And the last parameter is a lambda, the test itself, that will be executed by the test framework. Here we'll check that the function under test with the provided input will return an expected result. Let's execute our test method. And as we see, we get much nicer output. Now the test framework sees all of our test cases as a separate test case. It counts them separately. It marks them individually as passed or failed. Let's finally implement our function. It's relatively straightforward, rerun the test. They're green, we're glad, the times are happy. Let's compare it with the parameterized test. We need a source of the parameters for this method. And unfortunately, this is the Achilles heel of the parameterized test of JUnit, because the simplest value source is too limited, only primitives, strings, or classes, whole classes. That's obviously insufficient for most of realistic cases. So we'll have to rely on external sources. The method source, I think, is the only adequate for the unit tests. We have to define the method as a string, which is a bit clumsy, but okay, as long as it works. I will reuse the same test case structure as in the dynamic test example, for which I will have to pay because now it's a pair not very structured and it's coming from outside by employing some Kotlin Java interop magic. We can even reuse the original structure of the test cases by extracting it into a companion object and marking with GVM static annotation. Here we go. Parameterized test. Not too bad, but quite clumsy, honestly. With all those annotations and the sources somewhere else, and especially for Kotlin, you need to have them static, so they will be in the companion object. No wonder it loses popularity. And if you want to have custom display names for the test cases, 
we have yet another annotation with some weird templating language, it's so much fuss. Honestly, it's hard for me to imagine why would I ever use parameterized test of GUnit again, if there is such a convenient replacement with the test factory and dynamic tests. Although I should mention there is one feature which is missing in the test factory and present in parameterized tests, and that's the life cycle events like before each and after each. So here I run parameterized tests, and for every test case there was a before each print line executed. But for a test factory, the before each is executed only once before all the test cases, which is somewhat uncool, but these lifecycle events aren't very difficult to implement. After all, before all, those will be still executed in any case. Before each is trivial, you just call from the beginning of the test whatever you need to have set up. I would even argue in some other episodes that this might be a better, stylistically, way of writing tests. Maybe. To your taste. It's only that after each might be slightly inconvenient, but then again, no rocket science, either try catch and clean up or refactor your test to clean before, not after the execution, or in the worst case, register the actions to clean up and execute them in the after all. I could have argued though that if you do miss those annotated lifecycle methods, then you probably should have not complained that much about the clumsiness of parameterized tests in the first place. Because they are both coming from the same paradigm, where the test body should focus as much as possible on the action and assertions, and all the rest, like test structure and so on, that should be outside of the test body, in annotations. But as in theory, in practice there is of course an obvious difference between something that's good in small doses, like test annotations, fine, and when this something becomes too much of annotations. It's interesting to notice that GUnit 5 is slightly less annotation-centric than before, and we don't see that many of those pesky rules where in my opinion GUnit 4 went a little bit too far and started to extract integral parts of the test bodies into annotations, like accepted exception, a verifier, and so on. It's also worth mentioning that the dynamic test model, the test factories I just demonstrated, is advertised as a completely new kind of a test programming model in the GUnit 5 documentation. Anyways, this is what I wanted to tell you today. There will be a small exercise on hierarchical dynamic tests to close off this episode but the main point is, there is a way to build better parameterized tests within GUnit itself. Now, it's not perfect, but it should be good enough when you need something a little bit more dynamic than just test per annotation. And it should decrease the unnecessary pressure to abandon GUnit. Thank you for watching, and off we go for hierarchies. Hierarchies. What I learned by just making this video is that you can actually build hierarchies of nested dynamic tests. Not sure yet what to do this for, but this is how you do it. Dynamic containers can hold multiple dynamic tests in a hierarchy. I will create two containers, one for palindromes and another for non-palindromes. Then I will return the list of these two containers back. And then when we execute, we see a nice hierarchy of palindromes and non-palindromes. We could have achieved the same with two parameterized tests, but the beauty is that these hierarchies can be dynamic, so I'm sure there would be some good use for it.